the research towards the west. A small contingent, 25 strong, made up of vampires. These abominable creatures are not only more than capable of taking on four times their numbers with very little problems, Slain, they are my immortal and will simply just reform in the province of their creation after a short period of time. They are a truly nightmarish thing to have to deal with. Stuff of nightmares. To the north, Agatha is also pushing outwards faster and faster when something very surprising happens. The Agathan army is moving in one massive force of 1,200 troops because they do not need to eat. They can draw their subsidence directly to the ground beneath their feet. This show of strength was intended to intimidate Calum and allow the Agathans to simply roll over the provincial defences and seize more and more territory. But it didn't work out quite the way Agatha had thought because the massive Pale One army was then assaulted by a force of no more than 400 bird men, the vast majority of which were mere Spirehorn militias, decided to bring the Gothen forces to battle. This maneuver seemed to defy all common sense and logic. Whilst the Calamites had been able to summon some allies in the form of Draconians, Vyverns, and Griffins, there were nothing even close to the numbers that would be required to challenge the massed forces of the Pale Ones. And again, the majority of the Calamite army seen in the front were not more than Spire Force troops. Little armor, little weaponry. And yet, still had a significant number of mages, and surely they must have had some trick up their sleep, must they not? So here we have the Kalamite force. As you can see, the front rank is made up of the lightly armed and armoured militia troops. Intermingled amongst them are some large green-skinned dragons. These are fairly intelligent, half-dragon-like creatures, powerful combatants, but somewhat oversized as well. Due to their massive wingspan, only a couple of draconians can get into combat against the larger number of enemies, leaving them vulnerable. There are also some violins, small diminutive dragon-like creatures with a poisonous tail, and griffins, fairly violent animals the best of times. There is also a huge number of of Taylor, and a handful of ogres because, well, why not bring a handful of ogres as well? There are also some more powerful majors involved in the battle as well, including the Kalemite prophet brought back from the dead once more. Immediately, you can see the griffins are stunned by the Olms targeting large enemy creatures, already starting to do quite a bit of damage. The Kalemite Mages begin their bombardment, and this is the Agathan army. David versus Goliath, if Goliath was armed in 40k power armor. You may also notice a huge number of Mooses involved in the Agathan army. Yes, indeed. Those are neutral creatures brought along due to their ability to provide ranged support as each moose is ridden by two small goblin-esque creatures armed with short bows. The majority of the army is made up of massive ancient ones. This is how much time the Agathans have been allowed, to the point where now the primary force of their armies are no longer the small human-sized cave guards, but instead massive ancient ones and orbs. This is what a near uncontested economic advantage is going to do to you if you're up against Agatha. It is not a pretty sight. The Griffins land first, and the spell Storm is cut. Now, Storm will prevent the Kalaites from flying. 
you may notice that they also summon in huge numbers of air elementals. They are still able to fly even during the storm, but here, this is the trick. Wrathful Skies, a very large, very powerful spell that covers the entire battlefield in constant lightning strikes, doing 15 points of armor negating shock damage. And due to the fact that it's being cast in a storm, the number of strikes is doubled. Just look at the sheer number of lightning balls hammering down across the battlefield, along with all of the other magic being fired off by the Kaelamite mages as well. It is a devastating show, of course, but all parties have made a bit of a tactical mistake. You can see here all of the air elementals that were dropped in amongst the Garthen ranks. The air elemental is a summon, a battlefield summon. When created, it will shoot up into the air and land amongst the enemy's rearward ranks. Large numbers of the Agarthans have been set to attack closest, which means that they are not closing upon the largest possible number of Canaanites. Instead, they are turning around to fight the opponent. This is a small mistake on behalf of Agartha, but it is an almost equally, if not indeed larger problem for Caleb, since all of their mages are now casting their devastating lightning magic on only a small portion of the Agarthan forces. A small portion made out of massive ancient ones who are soaking up the punishment with barely so much as breaking stride. You will also notice that they've already slaughtered their way through practically all of the Spirehorn Militia, and are now in amongst the Draconians and the Dangers. While Thunderstrikes are hammering down across the battlefield, carving great rents in the Agathan armies, it is also striking Caleb's forces as well. And in a battle between 400 troops and 1,200, if anything even remotely like equal rates of attrition is applied, well, this is the result. Whilst the Agathan lost 600 troops, merely to the wrathful skies in and of itself, the Kalamite army was de facto annihilated. It had been a brave, last, desperate attempt on behalf of the Kalamite. It had mobilized everything it could in the way of manpower in an effort to destroy, or if not destroy, then at the very least shatter the Agartha army. They, what at this point, were starting to look more and more than ever. Five of their last major army killed for nothing to rely upon provincial defenses to try and stop the masked Agartha troops. They were trampled underfoot remorselessly and relentlessly, and soon, with the fall of the Kaelin the war in the north was over. The only enemy stronghold of any real significance that remained was Yomi's capital in the south, the abode of the heretical god of the Yomi Kaelin faction. But it, too, was not going to hold out much longer than Caleb. A much reduced but still significant Shepardan force had swept aside the provincial defences and were now standing outside the walls of Yomi. It contained several large scorpions, majors, storm demons, a handful of ocelotls, warriors, sun guides, and entry, the Una Queen, demon lords of the Lower Hell, come in significant numbers to aid the Alba in the final battles. On Yomi's side, bravely on the walls, whilst inside the fortress was a ragtag collection of summoned troops. Dispossessed spirits, hounds of the netherworld, a few bakemonos, some undead, and the last two of the Diones. Four Diones and a couple of samurai generals. 
It was not a force that would hold out long against the beast bats that descended upon it from up on the sky. In fact, the numbers seemed so heavily stacked against the Gormini's final engagement as the Shibalban scorpions flooded through the breach of the walls and Ozolotus began falling from the heavens, that out of the four remaining Pionis, only three had the courage required to stand and fight one last final time for the honor of Yome. And so the three last Dione on the continent stood bravely against the vastly intelligent superior foe, surrounded on all sides, and fought to the very end. That was a worthy of some good art right there. Whilst we enjoy it, let's uh, summarize a little bit, a out-of-character summary of the game itself. If you haven't played Dominions 5, I highly do recommend checking it out. It is a pretty damn awesome game, and it has an incredible amount of complexity. In this game, the parties chose their own factions, though we did have a discussion about which factions we were going to play to try and make it somewhat balanced, and I think we achieved that, because early on, Caelum was so close to delivering a near-fatal blow to Agatha. If that very first siege battle over Agatha's capital had either been won, or Caelum had just withdrawn one turn earlier, that would have been a massive blow to Agatha, especially after the loss of a huge number of Orlans in Trollheim. That was a very big deal. Additionally, the expanded very well for Yomi, although some early kings left um, a lot of them dead to provincial defences. The Dionys are very powerful, but they require a certain combination of spells and items to become the truly monstrous combatants that they can be. And early on, I as Shibalba had no real answer to the Dionys. I was rescued by a Dionys, otherwise I would have lost a lot of territory to just a single Dionys. The Orms were also something that uh, the Yomi player had not quite taken enough into consideration, but responded by stacking on magic resistant items on the Orms Dionys, which turned out to be quite effective, since at that point it needed a huge number of Orms to deal with a single Dione, since the magical resistance could be overcome, but it required a lot of Orms casting a lot of mind blast to get to going. But at that point, the scales had already begun to tip. The Yomi Kalamite plan was to cripple Agatha and Shibalba's economy via eternal storms, since neither Yomi nor Kalam in this particular configuration would need a whole lot in the way of money or resources, trying to rely more on summons and low-cost militia troops. However, they had not taken the characteristics of the deep. And so, whilst their own economy was ravaged, the economy of Shibalba and Agatha stayed pretty much exactly the same. And once Eternal Storms were lifted, the advantage became unsurmountable. Up until that point, the two parties had been pretty damn well matched, with both sides having a pretty good chance to inflict serious damage upon one another and keeping the war going. But once riches kicked in and storms went away, the economy simply just spiraled completely out of control, and Agatha was able to create ginormous armies of nothing but super heavy ancient ones and olds. At which point even wrath from the heavens, the big Kalamite spell, was just not enough to tear the tires of battle. Because even though it does in harm negating damage more than enough to kill any human, it would still require four hits to kill a single ancient one. And meanwhile, the Spire Horn militias were getting killed in one hit from those very self-same thunderbolts. Yomi and Kalem had bet on a very early game rapid aggressive strategy, and it had very nearly paid off massively as well in the case of Trollheim and Agatha. 
But once riches really started to kick in, that was no longer a workable strategy. And whilst they were in the process of transitioning away from it, Chivalva and Agatha were able to launch their attacks and push their advantage quickly enough to secure the But they also hate the Psyker. There are some exceptions. The Imperium's navigators and astropaths are two of them, because the Black Templars view these individuals to be personally blessed and chosen by the God Emperor, and therefore outside of the usual edict against any and all psychers. And they're also quite buddy buddy with the Grey Knights, presumably for the same reason, although the Black Templars themselves do not maintain a line of balance. They do not maintain Psyche of their own, although, again, this is another thing that has been through the retcon grind. To begin with, it was assumed because, well, they hate Psykers, so why would they accept them into their own ranks? Surely the God Emperor's fury and zeal is more than enough to overcome any warped sorcery after all, and uh, <laughs> considering the Black Templars have been scouring the galaxy for 10,000 years without pause, you can't really argue that they're wrong, now can you? And besides, if they absolutely need some form of aid against the psychic forces of their enemies, they're best buddies with the Ecclesiarchy and the Sisters of Battle. I'm sure they'd be able to acquire some worthwhile aid should they need it. All the way here at the end, let us have a little talk about how the Black Templar stands and are viewed in the modern day 41st Imperium, whilst they are under the command of Helbrecht the current High Marshal and the Supreme Commander of all the other Marshals in charge of their own crusading forces. Elbrecht was elevated from amongst the numbers of Marshals after the death of High Marshal Hotel. All of the commanders of the crusading forces came together and unanimously elected Helbrecht to be the new High Marshal. And to celebrate his recently elevated position, Helbrecht announced the Black Templars would engage in eight years of what they like to do best, genociding Xenos, and launched a campaign against a race known as the Sithor Fiends in the Ghoul Stars. They were a most vile and evil-looking Xeno species that had reacted with considerable hostility to any and all attempts to probe their area of space, killing and devouring, presumably, anything and everything that they considered to be in violation of their territorial boundaries. And they fought, most certainly, like the name suggests, like fiends. It took the new High Marshal eight full years to scour their vile presence from every single planet that they had defiled with their livelihoods. Until finally, the High Marshal at the head of three crusading forces approached their last planet, their presumed home world, only to find it completely and utterly abandoned with not so much a singular trace of the Xeno species remaining. This obviously missed the High Marshal, who denied his ultimate prize, but he didn't have too long to sulk about it, since soon thereafter, word came down that the Imperial world of Armageddon was under attack. And it was not the first time this extremely unlucky poor little dirt ball spinning through space had been on the receiving end of the ferocious dicking, first at the hands of the demon Primarch Angron, and then at the hands of Gazgul Mag Uruk Thraka, the biggest and the baddest orc to ever cross the galaxy. Or, at least, so he views himself. And now, Gazgul had returned for a second time, making this the third war for Armageddon. Incidentally, I have an entire video series covering that conflict if you're interested, as it was the first proper major unified campaign for High Marshal Helbrecht, although he would play a relatively small part of the circus. 
he did, however, bring the unified forces of three crusades to the world, and the vast naval assets of the Black Templars proved crucial in defeating the Orcs in the Void. And when Gazgul decided to call it quits in an attempt to escape Armageddon, the High Marshal was oh so very close to being able to hunt down and finally kill the Orc Warlord, but Gazgul fled into the warp just before the High Marshal could get to grips with his skill erector spaceship. But despite the flight of his quarry, the High Marshal had gained for himself quite the reputation amongst the other Space Marine forces, and had proven to everyone who might have doubted him that he was more than worthy to take up the mantle of High Marshal. Though ironically, Hellbrecht himself would actually come to doubt that very thing himself, after a defeat at the hands of Imhotep the Stormlord one of the rulers of the ancient Necron dynasties, a race of mechanical skeleton monstrosities with hyper-advanced weaponry. The Black Templars had arrived to aid in the defense of a plant by the name of Schrodinger. It was under attack by the Necron forces under Imhotek, also known as the Stormlord. The Black Templars were not able to decisively engage and annihilate Necron forces, and Helbrecht, leading the assault personally, ended up in a one-on-one -on -one duel against Imhotek. And that is a very unenviable position. A Necron Lord is no slouch in hand-to-hand, -hand, and he has several advantages over a human, even one as enhanced as a High Marshal of the Black Templars. Firstly, Imhotek can regenerate almost any wound done to him. Secondly, he never tires. And thirdly, his offensive weaponry is devastating. The Necron Lords have access to weaponry that can slice through even Astarte's power armor like butter. And slowly but surely, after an extended exchange of blows, High Marshal Helbrecht fell down exhausted. Also, after he'd been fighting his way through the mechanical hordes of the Stormlord. But, instead of finishing him off, Imhotek instead severed Helbrecht's right arm and stated that he would let him live, and that the arm was just so that Helbrecht would forever remember the stake of his defeat. The Black Templars, unsurprisingly, flew into a cellar's rage and rallied towards their fallen High Marshal, recovering him and then subsequently retreating from the leaving Imhotek and his Necrons in command of the planet. Helbrecht did not need this command. He went on a five-year-long self-imposed pensioned crusade to pay for his mistakes. And once it was done, he returned to the ancient chapter home of the Imperial Fists, Phalanx, a gargantuan space born of unrivaled destructive power, where he sought the guidance of Primarch Rogel Dawn, or, at this point, what was left of him, a single hand. Nothing more of the Primarch has ever been recovered, leading many to suggest, myself included, Dawn is probably still alive somewhere out there. Now, I shan't comment too much on the uh, morbidity of a one-handed man seeking out the literal hand of another man for guidance. The loss of a hand was a measly incident and could even be seen as a sign a challenge for him to overcome, rather than something to bring him down in defeat. And intent on revenge, he tracked down Stormlord and managed to board his tomb ship, the Inevitable Conqueror. No small feat in and of itself, because tomb ships are remarkably Elbrek then fought his way through the interior, and once again came face to face with Imhotep. And if you piss off a Black Templar, you really better make sure you kill him. Because Helbrecht wasn't dead, 
and Imotech very nearly was, managing to teleport out at the last instant, waiting just long enough to congratulate Helbrecht on their one victory apiece resolution. This, um, this, this twisted Helbrecht's nipple something fierce, and, um, well, as to what happened after that, the uh, tomb ship, the inevitable conqueror, was destroyed. And uh, some would have you believe that Helbrecht did it personally. <laughs> One neck on brick at a time. <laughs> I would think that perhaps to be a slightly overblown tale, but um, Helbrecht might just be angry enough to at least try. So now, of course, he's chasing down Imotech once again to finally settle the score properly. Elbrecht is these days a respected and venerated master of the Adeptus Astartes. The Black Templars are viewed with a hint of suspicion by some, but they don't have enough to go on, and even if they did, I frankly doubt that anyone within the Inquisition would want to kick that particular hornet's nest, as no one would really benefit at all. There are also certain forces within the Imperium that are resentful of working alongside the Black Templars due to their somewhat um, zealous views on purity and the psychic arts. Some chapters that value their librarius more than others, for example, will find very few friends amongst the Black Templars. Though, a fair few outcast chapters that find very few friends other places count the Black Templars as one of their closest allies. The Celestial Lions, for one, an unfortunate chapter that ended up on the wrong side of the Inquisition's beating stick. Templars have a little bit of a, <laughs> a relationship with them as well. The Inquisition might have their suspicion about the Black Templars, but the Templars hold no such suspicions towards the Inquisition. They fully recognize them as the bastards that they actually are, and are not particularly hesitant about letting them know. And to the right of the Imperium, the Black Templars may be one of the most perfect manifestation of the Space Marine Oath to forever protect the Imperium and destroy its enemies. Due to their crusading nature, they always seem to be right where they are needed. And since they don't take the Codex party, they are able to be whatever they are needed to be in enough numbers to make a difference. And at the end of the day, that is all the average citizen of the Imperium really cares about. The God Emperor's Avenger Angels are there to protect them. And the Black Templars have made good on most of their oaths of protecting worlds. Ferried from planet to planet aboard their massive armada of strike cruisers, battle barges, and frigate escorts. The Black Templar's crusade is far from finished. As of yet, no force in the galaxy has proven capable of stopping them. So I am sure they are going to be continuing their purging, crusading ways for another 10,000 years. Until next time, I've been Arch, thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Yeah.
购，隔上车共享，假租一环，轻松租还。想购就购，购。跑步机、游泳机、篮球机，想动就动，舒缓冒汗运动机。小妹，洗头、洗脸、洗澡，一瓶搞定。想动就勇敢去动。小妹，型男必备神器，混合氨基酸配方，先洗肌肤，启动肌肤防御力。小妹，让你帅到没朋友，只有女友。This is Rem Lays from 40K Theories, and welcome to this new episode of 40K Law for Newcomers. In this episode, we will take a brief look at the Warhammer 40,000 timeline. While this video will focus more on humanity's actions throughout the timeline, certain important Xenos events will also be documented throughout. So without further ado,